we're gonna we're gonna get started um, and let folks in as uh, as it uh, as the debate begins. And we're just gonna start off by uh, doing some introductions and then talking a little bit about how the the rules for this uh, are going to work. So my name is Ben. Uh, I'm one of the organizers with the Rent Strike Bargain Campaign in the Vancouver Tenants Union, uh, who helped put this together. Uh, and I am joined here with both Cameron and Ishma. Um, the three of us will kind of collectively be uh, introducing folks and then also moderating. Um, just going to start with a land acknowledgement. So we'd like to start this debate by acknowledging that the riding of Vancouver Langara is located on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people which are the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. Um, we believe strongly that in all our discussions of housing, uh, we must frame this in the context of the land that the housing, which, uh, that, that the housing will be built on, uh, which was stolen and has not yet been returned. Um, so as mentioned, the event is being put on by Rent Strike Bargain. Uh, it's a provincial campaign for collective bargaining rights for tenants uh, in collaboration with the Vancouver Tenants Union. Uh, if you're interested in getting involved, uh, you can go to the Vancouver Tenants Union's website or email us at rentstrikebargain at gmail.com. Um, for the debate, uh, each candidate will be awarded two minutes to speak on each question. Uh, the moderators will give signals uh, twice, once when you're halfway through the allotted time, and then once when you have 10 seconds left, uh, after which you will each have an additional one minute to respond to the other's remarks. Uh, if the moderator feels like we're getting too far off topic, they may jump in to reframe the question or interject if they feel something offensive or inaccurate has been said. Um, but otherwise, we're leaving the floor pretty open. Uh, unfortunately, Michael Lee, the Liberal candidate, uh, an incumbent in the writing, dropped out of the debate late yesterday evening. Um, we are an impartial organization, but uh, since no good reason was given, we can only assume he does not wish to speak on the issue of housing. Um, Tesca and Stephanie, before we introduce the moderators further, uh, to get started on the debate, would you like to introduce yourselves? Absolutely. Um, thank you so much uh, for hosting us. And uh, again, I also want to acknowledge that I'm calling in and this campaign is running on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Slay with Youth Peoples. Um, and Vancouver Lingara in particular is actually home of um, the ancestral uh, city uh, of Mus uh, Musqueam city as well of Cessna. Um, there is a documentary for those of you who are interested in, in knowing more about that. And um, this Monday, this past Monday, I actually had a chat with uh, Chief Wayne Sparrow as well. So I went to visit Musqueam Nation and, um, and that's just, I think, a starting point. I'm very committed to continuing to have these conversations um, with uh, whether it's Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam, but I think uh, really in solidarity with Indigenous folks um, on this land. Uh, my name is Tessica Trong. I also go by Zhang Chiying, Zhang Chiying, and Trong Tuan. Um, I, I have a Vietnamese and Cantonese and, and Chinese name because, you know, I, I've grown up as a Vietnamese, Chinese, uh, Canadian, and a settler on these unceded territories, these unceded Coast Salish territories. And I'm running to be your uh, candidate, to, or to be your MLA in, in Vancouver Langara. Um, so maybe I'll end my remarks there just to keep it short. But uh, thank you so much for having us. And also thank you, Stephanie, for participating. I'm, I'm really, really glad to see you here. Um, Thanks. I guess that means I'm next. Okay. <laughs> My screen is still Tessica. That's why I'm like, whoa. <laughs> no, it's always it's always great to see to see you here too, Tessica. And and as as uh, Tessica said, um, the uh, the name of the the Marple land that I'm on the uh, Cessna. I just learned that that Marple Midden is actually from pre-contact. So that actually brought me some relief that uh, the Marple Midden wasn't from people that the uh, settlers killed. It was from, it's way, way, way older than that. So I was, I was pretty uh, <laughs> relieved, <laughs> let's say. So uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so my name is uh, Stephanie Hendy. I'm the BC Greens candidate for Vancouver Langara. And um, I have been a, Vancouver resident, born and raised. I grew up in the south uh, southwest uh, housing project of Falls Creek in the 80s and 90s, and uh, so I'm aware of the uh, fortune that I've had in uh, being separate from a lot of the uh, housing volatility uh, that existed in Vancouver, and now having lived in uh, Fairview and now in Marple, um, 
seeing the the ads around town for the Vancouver Tenants Union made me really um, excited and wanting to get involved, especially once there was a, a Marple chapter opening. So um, I firmly believe that uh, the people that you elect to to represent you should be going through the same struggles that you're going through in order to be able to speak to it um, appropriately. So uh, that's why I stepped forward to run in this election. Thank you both. And, and we're very appreciative that you could make it tonight. Um, so to start off, I'm, I'm just going to uh, let Ishmam and Cam also introduce themselves uh, as they'll be the ones predominantly asking the questions tonight. Uh, Ishmam, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, my name is Ishmam. My pronouns are he and him. Um, and I do organizing work with the VTU and um, with the Rent Strike Bargain uh, Committee. Um, and uh, it's a deep honor to be here. And I'm really excited to for a night of discussing housing here in Vancouver, Langara. Over to you, Cam. Hi, I'm Cam. I use he and I use him. Uh, and I do work with uh, not only Rent Strike Bargain, but also the Autonomous Tenants Union Network, primarily in the so-called United States, uh, and with the Victoria Tenant Action Group uh, on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, um, which uh, have been stolen and unseated. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to uh, expand the, the discourse on housing, uh, not only in this riding, but in this election, uh, further tonight, because I think it's uh, been under discussed thus far. Awesome, thank you both so much. Uh, and Ishmael is also a Vancouver Langara voter, which is uh, an exciting note. Um, yeah, so the, the way this will work is we have nine questions lined up for folks uh, and each candidate will rotate who answers the, the first question uh, or answers the question first. Um, and to start, uh, I believe the first question will go to Stephanie and then to Tessica. Uh, and I believe that will be Cam, uh, on to you. All right, so with that land acknowledgement as context, a Squamish Nation member uh, requested that we ask each of you how you will work with First Nations across the province to help develop more affordable housing. And that's, that's to Stephanie first. Hi, okay, so um, first of all, uh, you know, we want to, we want to make sure that we're engaging um, indigenous people in these conversations. So we can't think about just uh, plumping up our services to better support them. We actually need to include indigenous people in the conversation. So, you know, asking them what their community needs and ensuring that we've got funding, whether that's through, BC housing, whether that's through rental supplements, whether that's through uh, redesignation of, of their, you know, their own lands to be able to um, look at the look at the different housing concerns that they have. You know, um, I think that it's been pretty terrible to see, you know, the types of living conditions that people in res have to go through. And so, you know, being able to look at you know, where are we getting funding as a province and how can we make sure that there's more funding being returned <laughs> to the people who we stole the land from uh, is going to be really uh, fundamental to all of our, our conversations. Perfect, and I can go next. Awesome. Um, well, first off, I really appreciate that question. And I, I ex especially because I think often events start off with a land acknowledgement, but there's no further engagement with the, the issue and with the, the conversation. Um, and I would say that it's really through relationships, right? And I have relationships with folks who are part of Squamish Nation, who are advocates, who are spokespeople for Squamish and, and I'm building relationships with folks uh, with Musqueam and also with tsleil as well to make sure that I'm in conversation and dialogue with, there's uh, several major uh, development projects that, that 
MST is leading. Um, and I think that the provincial government absolutely has a role in supporting and, and advocating um, uh, to, to make sure that uh, the their housing needs and interests are supported. Um, I would also say that the BCNDP government has already been and doing some of this work. Um, I think specifically, I would point to the example around temporary modular housing. I know there that was a project um, in, in Vancouver Langara that I think Ishmam, you might have actually, we haven't met, but I, I've heard of you because um, I was really proud when I heard that students um, were supporting and organizing um, from Churchill, my, my alumni or my alma mater school as well, um, to support um, for temporary modular housing. Uh, in Vancouver Langara, there's also a specific project um, uh, where Hogan's Alley, uh, the historic black community in Vancouver has also, um, yeah, where there was a temporary modular project that was specifically to house only indigenous and black folks um, in, in terms of supporting them. Um, uh, yeah, people who who don't have a roof over their heads and making sure that they have a place to live. And and I think when they first started doing working on that project, there wasn't actually disaggregated data um, that was recording and collecting this information. They didn't know how many Black and Indigenous folks um, would be interested. They didn't know if there was a demand. Um, and I would say that organizers on the streets actually were the ones who went and talked to people who were Black and Indigenous and actually both Black and Indigenous um, to see if uh, they would be interested in housing. And of course, um, there was actually a long wait list after that. And I think that that is something that um, the BCNDP government is actually pushing to collect dis disaggregated data um, to make sure that we actually know who needs this housing and, and how has systemic racism and the history of colonization in this country um, or this land, I think that we also know, know as Turtle Island um, is, uh, has impacted and continues to impact many people. So I appreciate the question. And um, I, I'm personally very committed to working on this. Thank you both. I'll turn it over to Ishmael for our second question. Hold up, sorry. Well, really quick before we do that, one minute each, Stephanie, if you would like to, to respond in any way. Sure, my bad. It's all good. <laughs> um, there's no, there's there's nothing that there's nothing that I need to to counter with anything that was that was said. Uh, the only other thing that I would uh, like to mention as well as just that, uh, you know, the, the federal government, uh, you know, for the housing, for modular housing, I mean, ultimately, it's, it's really, it's really a shame that we are always dependent on these other different systems, and they're all colonial structures, which is even that much more frustrating for us to work within. So part of um, me becoming elected would be to also establish an intergovernmental task force between the um, indigenous groups, between the city of Vancouver, because that's going to be a big, they have to be on our side as well. Um, and as well as the federal government, because, uh, you know, uh, from what we've been hearing is that the, you know, the BC government's been asking the country for more money, and it just hasn't been happening. And so uh, we need to start talking about this as an as a need, not a desire. Thanks so much. Jessica, if you want to add anything, you have, uh, you have a minute as well. Um, uh, no, I, I guess the only thing that I would add is that there are projects M that MST, the Musqueam, Squamish and Slave Tooth Development Group have already proposed and are working on currently. Um, I, don't, I don't believe they are within my riding, but I think those are also um, projects where they actually own the land and they actually have agency already to develop um, their own housing. So I think um, just thinking about the lens from which we're asking these questions as well um, and, and making sure that the questions are empowering of, of communities that have been historically marginalized. Thank you. I think we'll move on to our second question then. And this question is uh, to Tessica first. Um, in addition to the devastating health consequences of COVID-19, the virus has also brought to light and exacerbated many of the crises that already existed in British Columbia. Renters have been particularly vulnerable as paychecks dried up and their ability to shelter in place was put in jeopardy. Now, as we enter into the second wave and beyond, what will you do to ensure renters remain safe and housed? So two minutes for Tessica and then two for Stephanie. Yeah, thanks for the question. As someone who has looked for a place to rent in the city, I, I completely understand how difficult and also how the power dynamics that are in play, especially when there's such a low uh, vacancy rate in the, in the city and, and in many parts of this region as well. Um, first off, maybe I'll, I'll talk about um, the BCNDP and what platform commitments we've made. And then I'm also happy to talk about my personal commitment to this as well. Um, so first off, um, during COVID-19, we, we committed, and I think this is, you know, I would really um, tip my hat to organizers 
others uh, who who push for this as well for rent freeze to make sure until the end of 2021 to make sure that um, renters who had been disproportionately impacted who had lost their jobs were also not losing their homes. Um, and then after that, we also um, have committed to only uh, to limit rent increases to the rate of inflation. So under the BC Liberals, they were they were um, the cap for rent limits were was the rate of inflation plus two percent. Um, and when uh, and we made sure to to put an end to that. Um, and so if reelected, um, we will continue to commit that there will be no rent increases until allowed until the end of January uh, 2022. At which point we will reassess because as you probably know, COVID 19 is uh, you know it's a a rapidly uh, it's a long term emergency. But I think we also need to, to make sure that we're assessing as, as the context continues to change. Um, and this is, you know, applicable to um, this, this cancellation of rent increases uh, applicable uh, across the board, even if it's uh, written in a, a lease as well. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we've also committed to a, a means-tested uh, rebate, a renter rebate for $400 um, a, a year for renters that are making under $80,000 as well. So we're trying to make sure that the folks who need it the most, who are low income and medium income, will actually have some of that, that one-time uh, uh, support as well. And then finally, you know, I think I'm per, on a personal level, you know, as an organizer and as a longtime advocate for housing, I'm committed to working with you as the various organizations hosting this. I, I'm, I'm happy to continue having conversations about what is working, what isn't working, and to be an advocate on the inside. Thank you. Um, same question for you, Stephanie. Thank you, Ishmael. So, um... What the BC Greens want to do, I'm going to look at this in, in two ways. So in terms of funding, uh, with regards to uh, rental assistance, uh, the BC Greens are very much strongly in belief that nobody should be paying more than 30% of their income towards rent. And so we want to offer um, a means-tested grant uh, to make up that shortfall. So that would mean, and that would be paid on a monthly basis. So that means that per year, someone could be saving uh, $1,500 to $2,000, depending on what their um, income is and depending on what they're paying for, for rent. So um, that's a big thing where we're going to be earmarking $500 million to be able to do this with the province so that it affects everybody, no matter the region that they're living in. Um, and then as far as a, as a personal thing that I would accomplish, or rather that I would work my tail off to make sure it happens, is uh, I, we have to halt all evictions immediately because uh, the evictions that started as of, what was it, August the 20th, late August this, this year, that's just not being okay. You know, we can't keep uh, asking people to pay for a roof and not be able to afford food. And that's ultimately what it's coming down to. So um, the, uh, yeah. Oh, and what, one more thing I was gonna say about the means tested grant is that, um, it wouldn't uh, discriminate people who are already receiving uh, other types of funding. So people that are getting funding, uh, seniors that are getting funding, or somebody that's getting a BC housing uh, supported suite, even if those uh, first, let's say first payers or first uh, lots of money still don't get their rent uh, below 30%, we will still top that up until they're paying at maximum 30% of their income toward rent. Um, thank you. You both have another minute to um, expand on anything that you've said or respond to anything uh, the other candidate said. So a minute each. Um, Tessica, you can go first. Yeah, I'm happy to. And maybe uh, just because it's a long list of things that we've done as well over the past three years, I just wanted to add a couple of things that, you know, since the BC NDP have come into power, um, we've been trying hard to reverse some of the harm. And as, as you probably noticed, uh, Michael Lee from the BC Liberals um, decided not to show up. And I think that's really um, indicative of how much of a priority it is. Um, but we also closed the fixed term lease loopholes um, that some landlords were using to bypass annual rent control. Uh, we eliminated the geographic rent uh, increase clause that allows uh, landlords to seek inflated and unfair increases in, in certain hot rental markets. And that was you know, uh, resulting in some tenants seeing increases of 73% um, a year. Uh, we also added new protections and compensations for renters facing evictions because of renovations or demolitions. Um, we also uh, included yet yeah, new protections for tenants of manu manufactured home parks and improved compensations for those who are uh, facing evictions as well. Uh, we also increased the benefits under the RAP, which is the Rental Assistance Program, as well as Shelter Aid for Elderly Renters, um, which is also called known as SAFER. Just 10 um, more seconds. Then, 
Okay, sounds good. I, I have a long list of, of, of the many things and I, I would encourage people um, to, to look online to see the work that we've done and are committed to continuing to do um, uh, to, to support renters as well. Thank you. Over to you, Stephanie, for a minute. Thank you, Ishmam. So uh, all I was going to uh, add to the information that I provided before is that uh, when, we're, when we're talking about low to moderate income earners, what we're saying is that the current threshold to get um, rental assistance as it is, is $40,000 per year. So we know that a lot of people are struggling, you know, making $40,000 a year. And uh, so we would seek to increase that income threshold for which people would be eligible for the means tested grants. So I don't, we haven't uh, specified a number, uh, but I'm guessing it would be at least 60, if not 80,000, because moderate incomes, you know, um, people are still, uh, struggle is, is happening among all, all, a lot of classes. And so we wanna make sure that renters still feel eligible to be able to get that funding. Uh, thank you. Over to you, Kim. So uh, according to the province's numbers uh, in the summer, 15% of rental households paid no or partial rent during the first wave of COVID. As the population struggles to get back to work in a down economy, rent debt has added a new challenge for people living in those approximately 90,000 units. Recently, Vancouver City Council passed a motion calling for the province to cancel this debt. Do you believe that tenants should be forgiven or have to pay for the rent debt that they've accumulated and why? And that's Stephanie going first. Thank you. Uh, do you prefer Cameron or Cam? Do you care? <laughs> Sorry? Doesn't matter, either is good. All right, okay, thank you for the question, Cameron. Um, I think it should be forgiven, absolutely. I don't think, uh, if you're having a, a support program where your rent is being waived, but then you have to pay back thousands of dollars over time, then that's not really leaving you farther ahead already in an, in an, an environment where you're having a hard time finding work or people are having a hard time keeping their work or people are feeling unsafe to go to work, right? And so that's not, uh, you know, that has to be something that the province uh, absorbs. And uh, I truly believe that uh, we need to be doing more to help people. You've got one more minute if you want it. I'm good, thank you. In that case, on to Tessica. Thanks so much. Um, and I, I, I guess I, what I can say is, so I can speak for what the BC NDP platform is, and then I can also speak to my personal commitment as well. Um, so first off, I think BC was actually the only province to give um, a temporary renter, renter supplement, uh, which I know, you know, it, it was $500 for families and $300 for individuals, um, in addition to the only province doing an evictions ban and a rent freeze during COVID. Um, and, and um, you know, Andrew Wilkinson and the BC Liberals criticized that. They said it was, you know, a formula for trouble. It, they, they called it not leadership they actually fought us on on the renter um the rent increase caps and so i think that um you know i think the bc ndp has been quite committed i think specifically to your question about um whether a debt should be forgiven i think that you know so many of us have had been having a, a difficult time during covid um and that's why i think part of part of the solution can be the 400 dollars a year rent rebate but i also know that you know many people are are have lost their jobs and continue to you know either be unable to 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 get work or uh, might not feel safe to, uh, to go into work and i think that we should approach this from a co compassionate lens um and so i'm open and happy to have conversations uh, within the party to see what could happen in and how we might be able to push for stronger supports for renters. You do have another 30 seconds if you want it. I'm good as well. All right, I'll pass it back to Stephanie for the one minute response. Sure, thank you, Cameron. So um, yeah, I was just going to uh, reiterate that um, all, rent all rental uh, support is not going to be contingent on if, you're, if you are already receiving funding from other sources. So um, when we're looking at discussing um, elevating people out of poverty and making it safer for people to live where they where they want to live, um, whether you're getting BC housing or whether you're getting additional funding shouldn't matter. Uh, everybody should be able to 
be able to uh, max out <laughs> at 30% of their income toward their, their living. So um, I just wanted to highlight that um, the BC Greens program is in addition to the systems that are already in place and, and also to add more funding to BC housing because as it is, the amount of suites that are available for BC housing subsidies is, is very, uh, it's not very many. And uh, I'm just as scared as the current seniors right now that aren't able to find, uh, aren't able to get the funding they need to survive. Thanks, uh, back to Jessica for her response. I guess the, the only other additional piece of information that I would add is that um, uh, people who have arrears now can't have until July 21st to pay them back. That's the current BCNDP policy. Um, and then we've also made it so that if landlords have the option of agreeing to extending the payments beyond July 2021. So I think it's a start. So it's it's not that people need to pay that back right away. And so they have time. Um, but but I'm also continue, I, I'm also committed to having conversations within the party to see how we might be able to ratchet up that level of ambition. Thanks to you both. Uh, and I do want to clarify that Ontario did have an eviction moratorium until late July. Uh, back to Ishmael for the next question. Um, this question is for um, Tessica first, and then Stephanie will have an opportunity to answer afterwards. In Vancouver, vacancy rates and new um, builds of rental housing remained low, while rents are among the highest on average in Canada. One proposed solution that has been argued for is vacancy control, a form of rent control that caps annual rent increases regardless of whether the suite is occupied by the same tenant or not. Proponents of this policy, like the VTU and like Rent Strike Bargain, argue that it removes the incentive for landlords to evict tenants and keeps rents low, while opponents argue it limits profits and discourages the development of new rental stock. If you were elected, what would your position on vacancy control be and why? Uh, first, Tessica, and then uh, Stephanie for two minutes. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. And, and this is a really interesting idea because I think it has the potential to, as you're saying, reduce the, the incentive for landlords um, to, to rent evict or to evict tenants um, in order to, to find tenants that would have um, uh, would be would would pay a higher rent. Um, I would say that you know the BCNDP has already made some changes in this direction. Um, of course, it's not this this exact proposal, um, but I think in, in terms of closing loopholes um, on fixed term leases that landlords used to be able to do. And and again, as I, I've mentioned before, I'm I'm happy to have conversations to to actually learn more about this proposal and to see especially like where in the world this has been uh, implemented already and and what have the impacts of that been. Um, because I think it's always interesting to look at case studies to see like how how has this policy um, had an impact in a different part of the world and whether if we if we decided to implement that in BC, um, if that could have a positive effect. So I'm very interested in hearing more about this proposal and would be happy to, to chat with um, to chat with you uh, to learn more. Over to you, Stephanie. Thank you for the question, Ishman. So um, the um, Excuse me, I absolutely support uh, having the cost of the unit tied to the unit, not to the person, because you can't, I mean, you know, somebody moves out and it automatically just goes up hundreds of dollars that makes it completely not feasible to, uh, for anybody to live in. So uh, one of the things that, <clears throat> excuse me, that the BC Greens uh, wants to work toward is establishing a capital fund to transition uh, rental housing into um, not-for-profit run rent excuse me housing that's been run by not-for-profits so what that means is that um you can't just uh, there's not enough control currently with it because of the current uh landlord tenant type of relationship and uh so we want to be able to ensure that there's fewer and fewer rental um opportunities for that uh profit to just get out of hand and uh, so we're, we're seeking to, to be able to um, further legislate the, the system and, and empower, empower the tenants. Um, I'm a big proponent of the VTU and I plan to work with them when I get elected or if I, if I don't, you know, uh, because I, I'm so firmly um, in alignment with, with this principle that you can't just, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's one thing that our rent goes up by inflation every, every year, but um, the suite, should also be should be capped at that same amount, if really at all. 
Um, I have a follow-up question for Tessica, uh, just because your party is the current governing party. Um, in December 2018, the BC Rental Housing Task Force, spearheaded by an NDP MLA, Spencer Chandra Herbert, published their um, recommendations and fi findings for rental housing in BC. And recommendation 10 was to not go forward with vacancy control. So the question is, would you be a voice um, within your party's caucus to um, push the idea of reevaluating your party's position on vacancy control? Absolutely. And that's why I'm running, because I think that, you know, uh, as, as you look at who's elected currently, whether it's um, from, you know, uh, um, yeah, from an age perspective of, of, of like, if you look at the breakdown of who there is actually a renter versus who's a homeowner, I think um, we need representation from folks who have actually, you know, lived this, who have the lived experiences. Um, and I'm happy to, yeah, I'm happy to be that advocate. I've been an advocate in the community on this for, I would say, a long time. And I'm happy to have these conversations. Um, and, and that's also why I'm showing up here today, because I, I'm open to having a conversation. I can't say that I know everything about housing, but I have been doing a lot of work advocate, advocating um, for housing housing affordability, whether that be at the, the municipal level, the federal level, and the provincial level. Um, and I've also been a long time, yeah, I've been part of, of uh, yeah, subscribe to and, and follow a lot of the work that you've been doing. Really happy about the advocacy that you've done for Nelia. Um, I think that's really important and I'm, I'm happy to continue these conversations. Uh, thank you. So both candidates have a minute to um, follow up on this issue. So Stephanie, you can go first for a minute and then we'll uh, hand it over to Tessica for a minute. I don't think I have much to add because um, I have a feeling it's going to come up in another question. So I'm just going to hold tight. <laughs> sure. Um, Tessica, do you have anything to add? Um, I think maybe just to clarify the piece that I mentioned around fixed term leases. Um, the reason that that is important is because some landlords were using that to bypass annual rent control. Um, and so they would pretty much give an ultimatum to renters to say, you know, at the end of this fixed term lease, uh, they could uh, they could actually um, ask for a, a new rent price that would be much, much higher than what was allowable. Um, and the renter would have to, you know, decide whether to agree with that or to move out. And so um, that that does have I, I think that does that is linked to the issue of vacancy control. Over to you, Kim. All right, for our next question, uh, we are talking about um, tenant unions. In the labor movement, unions were won in part based on the idea that there are massive disparities in bargaining power between workers and bosses. The BC NDP had previously run on a platform of expanding this recognition uh, to the relationship between tenants and landlords, but no such commitment exists today from the government. Today, the fight for collective bargaining rights for renters is supported by both the Rent Strike Bargain Campaign and the Vancouver Tenants Union. If elected, would you support legislation enabling tenants to bargain collectively and form legal unions? And that is Stephanie first. Thank you, Cameron. So uh, yeah, I'm uh, absolutely in support of this. The first time it was brought up at a rent strike bargain meeting, I was really excited because I thought, wow, how did this not, I'm surprised I'm only learning about this now in 2020. So I, you know, I would absolutely champion this because it's so necessary. You know, my, my concern is that I wouldn't want people to um, be called out for organizing and then risk losing uh, their suite. And so um, I would have to, you know, uh, respect the rights of um, the people wishing to remain anonymous because they might be afraid that uh, people would be learning about the organizing effort. So, um, you know, being on the inside and then legislating for, I mean, certainly I would need to chat with, with you and the VTU about how to, um, bring this forward as a, um, you know, a citywide initiative uh, first, you know, perhaps in Vancouver and Victoria and, um, you know, even other places like uh, Kelowna, Squamish, Whistler, um, and then be able to, to work on that. So um, yeah, it's, uh, I definitely want to uh, engage on this further because yeah, more, more tenants that are part of something, more rights, more collective bargaining. That's that's a big that's a big plus. That's a big security blanket that I want to work really hard to uh, establish. Thanks, and on to Tessica. 
Yeah, thank you for this. And um, I've actually done a bit of reading, uh, thanks to uh, Ben, who sent over some policy on this. And, and I think also the historic context for actually this, this idea is not a new idea. It's a, a very old idea. Um, and there was already work, in, I think, in the 60s or the, in the 70s to try to make this happen. Um, but unfortunately, in the 70s, there was um, there was legislation that was passed that prevented this from happening. So the source is actually at the provincial level uh, with the Landlord and the Tenancy Act. Um, whereas, and I think that there, yeah, I would be, I'd be really interested in having a conversation about how, you know, um, as you probably know, the BCNDP has been a long ally and supporter and work very closely with labor unions. Um, and I don't see why, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense that, um, that we also uh, take a similar approach when we look at renters who are disproportionately impacted and also don't have necessarily the same um, powers as landlords as well. Also, because if you look at landlords, they are organizing, right? There is Landlord BC, there is a, an organization that represents them as well. Um, even though I think the power, dis the power dynamics are disproportionately such that they already have um, a large amount of power. Um, but I think that's why organizations like VTU and um, and this campaign is so important because you're you're also organizing and building power as well. And I'm I will always stand with that. Thanks. Uh, and so Stephanie will have one minute to uh, respond. Thank you, Cameron. So uh, yeah, I I uh, I guess I'm embarrassed. I didn't do the the pre reading on it. I didn't. I wasn't aware that there was legislation in place that uh, forbid this from happening. So certainly if that needs to be reversed, I'll definitely uh, champion that. And uh, you know what, to be quite honest, if that's, you know, if that's something that would bring me from a front runner to a backbencher, I'm happy to die on that hill because honestly, I think that this needs to happen. Like I'm that uh, convinced that we have to have the right to be able to collectively bargain as, as, um, renters, because I plan to be a renter pretty much for the rest of my life. So it's uh, something that I want to make sure that uh, not only my generation doesn't have to face, but that future generations doesn't have don't have to face it either. Thanks. And uh, back to Tessica for her one minute response. Absolutely. Well, I think the, the main piece that I want to add here too is that well, over half the city of Vancouver rents, right? And this is not, uh, as Andrew Wilkinson, the leader of the BC Liberal Party has said, um, you know, a funky time in life. This is a very valued and dignified and will increasingly be, um, you know, um, it, it already is the majority of how, how folks live in Vancouver. Um, and so we need to be innovating and we need to be making sure that um, that renting renters have the security of tenure that they need in order in order to be able to stay in the city and to have the stability that they need to continue to live here. Thanks. Uh, back to Ishmael for our next question. Sure. This question is for Tessica first, and then Stephanie. Um, the question is: Do you believe that the province should expropriate empty or mismanaged buildings to provide housing? Uh, if yes, what would qualify a building for expropriation and what level of compensation, if any, do you believe the province should provide? If no, why? Um, so Tessica for two minutes and then Stephanie. This is a really interesting proposal. I will admit this is the first time that um, that I've heard of it. So I don't I don't believe that I have enough information to to really um, to give you specific details about numbers. And but I um, but I, what I would say is that um, the temporary modular housing initiative and proposal, um, for those of you who don't know, it is um, is specifically in response to the homelessness crisis, right? That so many people in BC don't have a roof over their heads, um, and so this this BC NDP government, when elected, made a commitment early on to make sure to try to build more roofs over folks people's, people's heads. Um, and um, as you know, Ishmam, like there was a there was a specific project in Vancouver Langara, but I think twenty other projects across the the province. Um, to make sure that that people not only have a roof over their heads, but also have wraparound supportive services, whether that be mental health supports, whether that be addiction supports, um, so that they have, um, yeah, just the, the professional support in order to be able to, to get back on their feet. Um, and the other piece of it, and the reason why I bring it into this conversation is because it, it, it was placing temporary modular housing onto land that has been underutilized and that is already owned um, usually by the city or, or by um, uh, uh, by a certain level of government um, that has has not yet developed it as well. So I, I think that there is a huge argument and I would say when I was I co-founded City Hive, uh, we did some work, we ran a, a, a pop-up think and do tank for 30 young leaders under 30 from a diversity of backgrounds, whether that be, you know, videographers, horticulturalists, engineers, um, talking about how 
um, you know, as young people, we've already been disproportionately impacted uh, by the housing crisis. Many of us have had to leave or, or have had to make very difficult and sometimes unsafe decisions around um, our living conditions. Um, but for some of us, you know, there, there have been creative solutions that, that have um, that that we've uh, come up with uh, that can be potentially amplified and supported. Uh, and one of the the ideas that came up was this idea of looking at how can we look at temp like lots uh, around the city, around the region that are underutilized right now and are just sitting um, that developers and other organizations or sorry other um, landlords are just uh, leaving empty and and waiting for the land value to rise because I think that that's really um, something that shouldn't be happening in a city where we have a housing crisis. But anyways, yeah, so I don't have as much information. I would love to continue to chat to learn more about, um, about this proposal. Sure, thank you, Tessica. Over to you, Stephanie. Thank you for the question, Ishma. So uh, again, I'm sort of in a similar boat with Tessica where I didn't really know a whole lot about this um, idea. Uh, what I can say is that, um, because the BC Greens want to, uh, again, try to put more, uh, excuse me, establish a capital fund to um, change a lot of the rental uh, organizations into nonprofits. If we're looking at uh, creating new housing, that's always going to be expensive. So to me, it makes sense that if there are a bunch of buildings that have tons of suites that aren't actually being lived in, then why can't we buy out that building and repropriate it to become rental housing? Um, so uh, you're asking what that threshold would be or how that would be established. I mean, that sort of thing hasn't been discussed at a policy level, but I would argue that if the suites are uh, 70% unoccupied, that that would be um, enough of a, a tilt beyond uh, half to say that that's 70 suites, 70% 70 of those suites could be occupied by people. So, um, you know, that being said, that would also mean that those 30% of those people would get displaced, right? So you'd have to find a way to use the existing funding model and uh, be able to, uh, as you said, re or repropriate it so that they can be uh, utilized by renters, right? So um, I would imagine that the landlord in this case would either be uh, the province of British Columbia or um, you know, treat it like a co-op and use the community land trust funds to be able to, to buy up those, uh, those suites or that land because uh yeah you know we can we can throw money at the cooperative land or see it sorry the community land trust to build more costs but ultimately building more new things still makes them uh out of reach you know the fraser view co-op that opened on jellico and southeast marine studio apartments are 1300 dollars a month in a co-op so it's not really the same as the current co-ops where there's a 10-year wait list because those ones are uh you know seven $800 a month for a one bedroom suite, right? So that's kind of more, you know, in the line that I want to be looking at. So um, yeah, I absolutely want to look at more uh, creative strategies to not just increase um, the amount of housing available, but to really look at how are we utilizing the land and the buildings as, as they exist and what can we do to, to fix that, make that more effective. Thank you. Um... Over to you, Tessic, if you would like to respond to anything that Stephanie said for a minute. Yeah, absolutely. I think because you brought it up, Stephanie, just around, uh, yeah, uh, using and looking at housing that's already being underutilized, that's exactly why the BCNDP government put in an empty homes tax, because unfortunately, too many people are looking at housing as a commodity as opposed to housing as a right, um, and looking at housing as homes first. And so since we introduced the empty homes tax, which really you know, penalizes folks who are just treating housing um, as a commodity, looking at it as an investment and leaving it to sit empty, uh, 11,000 um, homes or units have been put onto the market. And so that that is an idea that um, the BCNDP have already been working on and, and would con I think will continue to, to do work on this. I would also say that uh, just to add additional context, uh, in 2017, after uh, the switch in government, uh, 
the BCNDP in their first budget introduced a 30 point plan on housing because we know that there's no silver bullet to, to solving the housing affordability challenge. Um, and then from they measured each of those actions to see which ones would be most effective and then ratchet those up. So uh, the impact of that um, is that over the past three years, housing prices on average, and I know this is, you know, this is specifically to housing, um, have still gone up by 3.9%. But in the previous three years, between 2015 to 2017, under the BC Liberal government, uh, housing prices went up by 55%. Um, so you can see that tangibly, there's been an impact um, that the, by uh, the measures that have been put in place by the provincial government, as well as other levels of government, um, but I would say predominantly um, the provincial government. Um, thank you, Tessica. Over to you, Stephanie, for a minute. Thank you. Um, I was just going to say, uh, you know, I read that um, 30 point plan and I thought it was fantastic, uh, but I didn't really see a lot of movement on it. So um, I would love to keep <laughs> holding whoever uh, is in power more accountable and say, you know, this was great. We spent all this time and energy on creating a structure. Let's take action on it. Right. I think um, politicians are doing too much talking and not enough taking action and so i think that that really needs to happen and uh you know more more renters need to be elected so they can speak to that personally um just before i pass it over to cam just a little bit of context um that danny has provided in the chat um recently two sros in vancouver the regent and balmoral hotels were expropriated for a dollar each which was viewed as a massive victory um, for the people who lived in um, these buildings and also the people who rely on SROs as a form of housing. Um, and Danny right, rightly points out that this is an option for the hundreds of buildings in the lower mainland that exist in disrepair um, and that can be used to provide safe and dignified housing for people. So thank you, Danny. Okay, um, we will move on and I will pass it over to Cam for the next question. Thanks, uh, and I should note as well that um, can't remember exactly how many municipalities, but I know that uh, Victoria City Council, for example, did request uh, earlier in the pandemic that the province uh, begin expropriating uh, hotels and other buildings that were uh, empty or, or otherwise could be used to uh, provide housing. Um, and keeping on the topic of, uh, of this municipality, uh, the Victoria Tenant Action Group's Can't Stay, Can't Go survey, which I worked on uh, two years ago, uh, found that although 46% of the 500 renters we surveyed in the area believed that they had been exploited in their housing situation, only 12.5% of those pursued a claim at the residential tenancy branch. So about a quarter of people who thought their, uh, their rights had been violated. Uh, those who didn't uh, pursue a claim cited the unpredictability of the process, lack of faith in the process, uh, and the downside of losing, uh, and on short notice, uh, not having a new home lined up. Uh, to switch over to if they lost their case. Would you change anything about uh, the tenancy dispute process uh, to increase tenants' access to it or their faith in it? And are there parts of the Residential Tenancy Act you would look to change if you were in government? Uh, and that is two minutes each, beginning with Stephanie. Thank you for the question, Cameron. So. Um... I guess I would have to say that, uh, you know, the, the current uh, time limit of uh, being able to be suspended would need to be increased to be able to extend uh, beyond that uh, court date. Um, but I am aware that they were all going to court because they, they weren't currently being housed. Is that correct? Sorry, uh, this is for um, dispute cases when, for example, someone receives an eviction notice. Oh, okay. So like Nelia's uh, story. Uh, similar to that. Um, okay. So, uh, so yeah. So in that case, yeah, absolutely. We'd have to be able to legislate there to be more, more protection. And uh, I also feel that, you know, someone's uh, MLE needs to be negative, right? So, you know, people should be able to write to me or my constituency office and have uh, a rapid response because in these instances, time is everything. So, uh, you know, 
if it, if it comes down to me helping them through that process, then I'll do what I can to do it because anytime there's a system or bureaucracy or paperwork or something that gets in the way, um, you know, that's, that's incredibly frustrating. So, you know, if that means uh, directing somebody to uh, legal, legal aid or being able to uh, get them the resources they need, uh, we need to be able to make that process a little bit less daunting or make it clear who the people are that could help people in these situations. Because the, the, the strange thing about this province is that there's, there's a lot of resources available, but they don't exist in a central manner that's really obvious for anybody to access. So we really need to make, uh, make sure that people are aware of what's out there and that they feel uh, comfortable in being able to tap into it. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, two minutes on the clock for Tessica now. Thanks. And sorry, do you mind repeating the question? Sure. Uh, it was there was a few sentences to it, so I'll uh, take another run at it. Uh, so VTEG uh, did a survey that I was a part of. Uh, we found that 46% of renters believed they had been exploited in their housing situation. However, only 12.5%, so about a quarter of that number, uh, pursued a claim at the residential tenancy branch. Uh, those who didn't pursue a claim cited the unpredictability of the process, their lack of faith in it, uh, an information, information sorry, gap in it between them and their landlord, uh, and the downside of losing um, and uh, with short notice not having a new home lined up. Uh, would you change anything about the tenancy dispute process, um, so the residential tenancy branch, uh, to increase tenants' access uh, to it or faith in it? And are there parts of the Residential Tenancy Act uh, the law that governs that process uh, that you would look to change if you were in government. Yeah, absolutely. And and what I know is that the BCNDP government, um, when they came in, introduced a compliance and enforcement unit um, as well. Because yeah, absolutely. There are I think the uh, yeah RTV has uh, from from folks that I, I know and have spoken to. Um, not only are there long delays, um, but I think it's also complicated to navigate. And in my conversations with TRAC as well, um, an advocacy group that supports uh, renters um, in navigating this process, they take on kind of landmark cases that might be able to push a, pres a precedent. Um, but but yeah, I think they're they're often at capacity because there's way more need than there's demand. And I think that that points to an upstream uh, challenge as you're articulating, Cam, um, that that needs to be looked into. And as someone who you know has experience has has on through the process of trying to rent in the city multiple multiple times, um, I understand uh, very clearly the challenges and also the power dynamic dynamics that are at play, right? Because often you just don't have the time, the energy when you're facing a potential eviction or renovation um, in order to to go and find and navigate a process and, and feel feeling like you're gauging or um, making a bet on on. Um, potentially winning a case uh, you don't have the time you don't have the energy and you're focused on actually just get securing a roof over your head and so absolutely i think whether those those be financial supports whether those be more generous timelines uh for the the person uh, for the renter um i think there's multiple things that we can discuss and look into um and and i'm committed to to be an advocate on the inside again as as, as i've uh, been saying over this call thanks so stephanie you have a minute uh, of time to respond to that if you like Thank you for that, Cameron. So, um, yeah, you know the the residential the residential tenancy board um, or the residential tenancy act uh, doesn't really provide enough uh, safeguards to tenants. Just like the employment standards act really favors the employer and not the employee. So, we need to definitely revise the systems that are created to protect the people that are the most vulnerable and uh, create that so that there's a lot more safety. So uh, yeah, if they, I mean, first of all, I hate that they would have to go to court in the first place, but second of all, you know, yeah, we need to make sure that people have um, a grace period, even if they lose their case, then the provincial government should be responsible for paying for somebody to be rehomed because it's traumatic. It's already traumatic enough to go through a court case. Now you're also homeless. Like that's, that's, not, that's not helpful. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, and on to you, uh, Tessica, with one minute. Uh, and I should maybe note that uh, in the comments, people are pointing out uh, that the NDP has made various promises thus far on uh, reforming uh, the Residential Tenancy Act uh, and the uh, Residential Tenancy Branch. Uh, and, and people are pointing out that a lot of those haven't been followed through on. 
such as requirements around evidence packages uh, and deadlines. Um, so I'll, I'll, I will give you just a little bit of extra time for that response if you like, Tessica. Absolutely. Um, and I will say that this, I believe that this is a priority of the BCNDP government. You know, after 16 years of neglect, um, we created a task force, right? And as you mentioned, I think uh, MLA, or I guess he's a candidate now, but uh, Spencer Chandra Herbert uh, was leading that and, and talking with renters across the province, um, as well as landlords on, on issues on this. Um, and as I, as, as I mentioned previously, I think, you know, what we need are more folks who actually understand the, the lived experiences of, of ten, tenants, right? Because I think, unfortunately, um, if we don't have folks who are elected in, in Victoria um, that, are, that have those experiences, that understand, understand the, the precarity of being a renter um, and the challenges of being renters, like we won't have voices at the enough voices at the table to make sure that, the, that it is a priority, right? Because unfortunately, in three years, um, yeah, I, I just don't, I, I, I appreciate and I, I um, can empathize with people's frustration about this not moving quickly enough. Um, and I would argue that that is exactly why you need a vote and to show up and to not just engage right now, but I think as as uh, BTU is doing and as, as your campaign um, really pushing to continue to engage with me and other elected officials if we're, re if we're elected um, to make sure that uh, you're holding us accountable as well. Thanks. Uh, and over to Ishmam for our next question. Um, so this question is for Stephanie first and then Tessica afterwards. Um, and this question is about tent cities. Tent cities have gained a fair amount of media attention in the last year and have been subject to fear-mongering uh, campaigns from the BC Liberals and other political actors in our province. The province's current approach to tent cities has been characterized by dismantling them and housing a small portion of their inhabitants in temporary or permanent supported housing. Residents of tent cities have been forcibly removed from Oppenheimer Park and Crab Park in the past few months alone. Do you support this approach to tent cities? And if not, what would you do differently? Uh, so two minutes for Stephanie and then two minutes for Tessica. Thank you for the question, Ishmam. I just want to um, clarify that um, you're asking about the current people that are living in the tent cities. Do I support uh, a permanent or temporary uh, rehousing process? How would you deal with um, the tent cities? So the kind of what I said to preface this question was that the uh, current government's response so far has been lackluster and that they've been complacent to the removal, forcible removal of people from these tent cities and have really offered nothing um, in terms of permanent housing or substantial levels of permanent housing to the current residents of the tent city. And I'm wondering what you would do uh, differently. Absolutely. Okay. So, you know, um, it's clear that the housing that's been offered hasn't matched the amount of people that live in the tent cities. So, you know, the BC Greens strongly believe in a, in a housing first strategy. So I know that we are definitely uh, looking at using, uh, reallocating funds in the budget to be able to put people in housing immediately. Um, but I, you know, after reading the um, concerns of the people who were living, who are currently living in, uh, Camp Kennedy Trudeau, which I thought was an amazing name, by the way. Um, but uh, you know, the their major concern is that they're they're having a loss of community, right? So if you put people into a bunch of uh, you know social housing, but now they're all part of this thing where they don't feel you know uh, connected, that's that's pretty hard, right? So I think that uh, you know this housing first strategy, uh, first of all, it needs to be. Um, by uh, invitation. In other words, you go and approach people to say, hey, we have this option for you. Um, we'd really like you to join us, but we also have to be able to uh, allow uh, the tent cities to remain uh, autonomous as long as, as long as it's safe, right? The biggest thing is, you know, are we giving them, you know, porta potties? Are we giving them, you know, uh, things that they need to, you know, survive, uh, it, you know, be able to have the same luxuries that we do of, of cleanliness, uh, you know, then yes, w you know, we should absolutely create the housing for them to move into. Just 10 more sure. Uh, but uh, yeah, forcing people into it is not, um, we have to make, we have to make that structure more welcoming so that people want to want to go there. Over to you, Tessica. 
Thanks so much for the question. And um, yeah, I think I think the rhetoric that the BC Liberals have been using that pits homeowners and their safety against the folks, you know, who don't have, um, who either don't have a shelter or roof over their heads or who are living in tent cities is really harmful. And I would actually compare it to Trump style politics where it's creating divisions where there don't need to be them. I think we can we can actually tackle both. We can look at, you know, how do, how do we make sure people feel safe in their communities, but uh, not by, I think, uh, demonizing and, and that those that divisive and actually really stigmatizing language around people who, who don't have a permanent roof over their heads. Um, I think in terms of uh, the tent cities, like I, like my, my approach um, and how I would approach this is, is really, you know, um, from a dignity approach, right? Like looking at that everyone should have a roof over their heads. Um, and for various reasons, you know, whether some people have pets, right? And they're not allowed those pets at, at shelters or, or at um, temporary modular housing. I think there's there's a variety of reasons where people, I think it, you've also mentioned um, the sense of community, right? That they actually build connection community with, and also autonomy and agency um, with, with uh, with folks who they're living with. And so I think um, we need to approach and, and, and really talk to people who are living there to figure out, you know, what are their needs? Um, how are the housing needs not being met by current options? And, and how can really, we really center that to make sure that if, um, if we're asking folks to, um, and providing places for, for people to live in that they actually have the, whether it's mental health supports, whether it's addiction supports, whether, you know, it's the, the ability to have pets, the ability to have, to, to stay connected and, and to be, to stay connected to community as well, um, to look for housing solutions that actually meet those needs. And I think this speaks to a uh, more broadly, like a, a challenge in, in terms of matching housing needs with, you know, things that are culturally appropriate um, and, and actually really meet the accessibility needs as well. I know, Stephanie, you, you talk a lot, a lot about this, that the accessibility needs that folks have um, often are, aren't met. Thank you, uh, Tessica. So um, we now have time for another minute uh, for each of the candidates to speak. So Stephanie, you have another minute to add anything if you'd like, or ask a question to Tessica. Sure, thank you, Ishmam. Um, uh, oh gosh, sorry, my blood sugar is dropping and I'm losing the words from my brain. Um, what I was gonna say about the uh, the tent city too is that we really, we really, really need to make sure that when this housing gets created, um, that people aren't being asked by the police to go into those newly created suites for them. I think that this needs to be the job of community health nurses and social workers. Um, that's going to be that's a big thing that I want to champion from the inside. And that's, that's something that I'll continue to fight from the outside if I have to, because um, I'm a really big proponent in, uh, you know, uh, defunding the police and directing more, way more money to uh, public health because it's, uh, and community health, right? You can't, um, you know, if the staff aren't there to say, hey, we have a, a warm, safe place for you. Uh, if you're being escorted by a police officer, that's uh, you know, that's humiliating, and it's and it's not going to it's not going to build it, that doesn't build trust in the system. We need to have more compassionate people out there so that the police are uh, on the back burner. They're there if somebody gets physically violent, but they're not the first person that's going to squat down inside your tent and say, "Hey, how's it going? We have different options for you." Over to you, Tessica. Yeah, well, first off, thank you so much for hosting us. Um, this has been a really interesting conversation and, and actually I was I was really excited to hear some new proposals that hadn't, uh, hadn't come across my desk before and I would be really curious to continue this conversation beyond tonight. Um, I will say that Andrew Wilkinson and the BC Liberals have pretty much opposed every major action we've taken to support renters, whether that's a cap on annual rent increases, whether that's the speculation tax, whether that's additional protections for renters on fixed term leases um, or folks who are facing eviction as well as the COVID eviction ban. So, um, you know, I, I am really worried about this upcoming election. And that's why part of why I put my name into the hat is that I know that we can't let him and the BC Liberals reverse all these changes um, and let, I let, let both rent and also the housing prices skyrocket again and turn, you know, the 11,000 homes, the rental homes that we've created back into empty condos. Um, and this, I think this is what this election is all uh, truly about, you know, um, a government that will try to put people first and, and will be working to support folks, particularly the folks that have been most marginalized, whether that be folks who are working on the front lines and the health 
care sector, low income to me medium income folks. I mean, particularly renters, and that's my personal commitment uh, um, as well um, to as, as running as a, a young candidate, as someone who has this lived experience of, of trying to, to fight um, for, for housing in the city and knowing how challenging it is. Um, and uh, yeah, I just really appreciate uh, yeah the organizers for putting this together and also Stephanie for coming to participate. And I think Michael Lee uh, not showing up and not attending speaks volumes to him and his party's priorities. Um, thank you, Tessica. I'm just going to pass it over to Cam for our very last question of the night. Over to you, Cam. All right. Uh, so along with uh, the last question, I know that we are a bit over time. Uh, so I'll, uh, you know, the candidates should feel free to loop in closing uh, remarks with these two minutes uh, if they choose. Um, and this question, uh, the final one, was submitted by Abundant Housing BC. Uh, and it asks, official community plans or OCPs like the Marple plan, tend to focus on redevelopment on existing apartment areas. How should uh, the pro provincial government ensure that new rentals get built in a way that does not displace existing tenants? Uh, so again, two minutes for uh, each of those, beginning with Stephanie, uh, and uh, feel free to tack on any closing remarks uh, to this question as well. Thanks for the question, Cameron. So um, yeah, I mean, to me, this really goes back to the whole idea of who's owning who's owning the building. Is it being owned by a management corporation or is it being owned by a nonprofit or is it being owned by uh, a co-op? Uh, you know, there's, there's many different methods of ownership. So, you know, when we're looking at uh, people being displaced, what ends up happening is that often the building gets renovated and then the rent increases to match uh, you know, uh, the, the presumed um, value of that renovated suite. So that's not really, um, <laughs> that's not really helpful. So, you know, uh, but we do need to create more housing. So, you know, uh, again, I really just believe that we need to take more buildings away from the rental agent, rental management corporations, because they're not, um, they're not, regulated in the way that they should be. And I believe that the only way that we can fix that is not by, you can't really force regulation on a group that has a lot of money because they're just going to find their way to buy themselves out of it, right? We need to, we, the government needs to give more funding to uh, nonprofit organizations and existing organizations like BC Housing and the Community Land Trust to be able to buy out these these areas and, buy, and, and revitalize them so that they're safe and so that they still remain um, not uh, inaccessible for cost. So um, closing remarks is um, that, uh, <laughs> sorry, I've seen the, the, the chat things, I'm getting distracted. Um, you know, uh, people uh, need to be able to organize. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've got, I've got so many other things going through my head now. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, I mean, we have to be really, we have to be really careful that, you know, everything that we're doing, we're not taking a top down approach, you know, we really need to be able to ask everybody who's living through it, what the best solution is. So, you know, I've joined Marple Neighborhood House, I've joined uh, the Marple Bulletin Board on Facebook, I've joined the VTU to really, uh, you know, be able to listen to what are the best approaches for um, these measures from happening. And uh, when we talk about revitalization, we really need to talk about exactly that revitalization and not gentrification because uh, that's going to be something that's just going to make it uh, more and more uh, inaccessible for people. Thanks, and uh, two minutes plus uh, maybe a little extra as well for Tessica now. Thanks so much, Cam. Um, and I, I, so I would actually point to some of the work that has been done by in New West, uh, because there has been provincial powers that have been delegated to the municipalities where they can to, can push to have rental only zoning in certain areas, and that actually um, disincentivizes. Uh, real estate developers that are only looking to build, you know, uh, really expensive condos uh, uh, and and prioritizes and keeps it in, um, holds it in a rental pattern. Um, I would also say that, yeah, absolutely. I think spatial equity, especially when it uh, when it comes to zoning is really, um, is really, really important. And, and um, uh, New West has also uh, put in um, rules at the municipal level that allow um, or so that pr protect renters against rent evictions. Um, and I would say that, you know, uh, provincial, um, 
I am a big propo proponent of supporting municipalities and local governance, governments in order to have more power to support and to protect uh, renters in their, their city. And this has been work that has already been done at the provincial level, but I think I absolutely believe that there could be more done as well. Um, there's also been a first right of return uh, conversations that I, I've heard about um, that I think make, make a lot of sense and also uh, would make sense, especially if there are um, tied rates of, of um, uh, rental units so that it's not that you're if, if you're displaced that you're not coming back and renting at a much higher uh, rate, but I would be interested in, in hearing, um, yeah, more proposals and I, I, I defer to folks who have a lot more expertise than I and, and so would be happy to chat with you as, as organizers and folks who are spending a lot of time thinking and, and, and working with folks um, with this lived experience. So I appreciate the question and, and would be open to continuing the conversation. Um, and Stephanie, I know it's been, it's been, it's probably been a long day for you as well. And I'm also feeling, uh, yeah, I'm feeling that. So no, uh, is that good for you for closing remarks? I think we can give you a little bit more time if you like, but uh, whatever works for you. Yeah, well, I, I mean, yeah, I, I think I, I've already shared some of my closing remarks. I I, I just do really want to appreciate I, the the. the quality of, of so many of these questions, it, it's made me think uh, more about uh, additional levers and tools that we have at the provincial level and that we can also delegate to the municipal level because as we know, um, housing is an inter-jurisdictional issue, right? We need the collaboration of the federal, the provincial and the municipal government. And I'm not saying that because I want to defer responsibility. I actually want to own up for the role that the provincial government has um, and also that we need to work with municipal um, and federal levels to make sure that, because um, we don't have, we are, we're not the only one who have the tools or the funding to make this happen as well. Um, and rental is certainly a very important part of the market. And I also would want to advocate for co-op housing, co you know, co-housing. Um, there, I think there are, there are many, many forms of housing. Um, and we actually made an announcement with the Jewish Community Center earlier this week around um, community land trust. So not just building more, um, they're building purpose-built rental there. And, and I think often will be below market rental as well, but also childcare spaces and also redeveloping uh, the Jewish Community Center there as well. And, and I think it's those type of integrated solutions that we need to look for that um, that match childcare, that match housing, that also match community needs. Because even though it's a Jewish community center, they serve, I think over 50% of the folks that, that go there are actually from the community themselves. And so those are the type of solutions that those win-win-win solutions that, um, that I'm committed to looking for and working uh, with you and other organizers on. All right. Uh, I think we just because we're we're conscious of being a little bit over time, we're gonna we're gonna skip the one minute responses and also those were closing remarks. So I just want to say thank you so much to both Tessica and Stephanie for for making the time and for staying a little bit longer. I know your time is in uh, is, is quite valuable right now, so that's deeply appreciated. Um, I hope that this has been a uh, helpful session for everyone watching um, in deciding who you're gonna vote for in in the next election. Uh, and I can say we're both certainly excited to, to see uh, who we'll be working with um, once, uh, once Saturday has passed. Um, thank you so much, everyone. And just a reminder that uh, in the chat, we've uh, posted the email address for Rent Strike Bargain if anyone would like to get involved. Uh, and otherwise, have a great night. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you for organizing BTU. I think we're just going to, um, we won't close the Zoom down right away in case people want to um, to kind of back read and, and continue in the chat for a little bit. I know I've been frustrated at conferences and things when you're, the people finally stop talking and you have a chance to catch up on everything that's been uh, that's been said in the, uh, in the text box and then it disappears on you. So uh, no rush to get out of here. Uh, you know, we're gonna dim the lights a little bit. The floors are starting to get swept, but uh, you don't have to take off right away. <laughs> this is a very good analogy. <laughs> I'm going to take off because I, I do have to go, um, but it's okay if I leave because you two are co hosts and the Zoom room shouldn't shut down. But um, I will see you soon. Thanks so much, Ishmael. Have a good night. Okay. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes.